Afternoon all. I thought instead of uh, looking at the draws in um, Carlsbad 1929, um, maybe it's more interesting to look at other notable uh, Nimzovich tournaments, if we do want to carry on a bit with Nimzovich. Um, there is a key game he won in Semmering tournament in 1926. I think um, in the Semmering tournament he came about fourth. He was leading apparently halfway through the tournament, but uh, things turned around after. But uh, in this very dramatic game, he was playing uh, a, a few, you know, future world champion Alexander Alokhine. Um So, Alokhine, you know, put the dynamism back in chess after Capablanca had taken the principles of Steinitz and Tarash and kind of used them with such great effect that he almost became invincible. So, um, we owe a lot to Alokhine, but uh, this in this classic ca clash, it seems that uh, Nimzovich was the dynamic one. Um, and full of attacking energy. So he played E4 actually, <laughs> breaking his own hypermodern principles. He's actually occupying the center with a pawn. Okay, and Alakine plays hypermodern style with the Alakine defense, <laughs> provoking the pawn to go forward and create more weaknesses. But Nimzovich refuses. He plays actually knight C3, and then further encouragement to do something with the pawn with the move D5. Nimzo obliges, plays e5, and after knight fd7, here, interesting, in blitz, I'll be tempted for e6 as a temporary pawn sack, and then, and then d4, try and clamp down on, on the e5 square, and play it like this, and I've, I've sometimes won a few games like that, but um, it's probably not that um, sound. Let's, let's actually check that, just, just to make absolutely sure. So e6, it's not it's it's given us a, a a small advantage for white, believe it or not. So d4. Say so say black tr just tries c5. This is still given by Ribka as a small advantage. This position, uh, as an example. So bishop d7. Say white's got a bit of overprotection of an e5. So anyway, Nimzo doesn't play that e6 move. In fact, here he just plays f4. And after e6, um, Alakine's getting, or rather Aliakin, uh, but I'm going to say, <laughs> he, uh, he's, he's playing it like a French defence now with, with the bad bishop, so um, knight f3, c5, but um, Nimzo doesn't occupy again the centre with d4. In fact, he finchettos his king's bishop, and it's clever how he makes use of the e4 square later, but uh, Aliakin's, um, you know, queenside counterplay. And and pawn sacrifice later, you know, give him tons of play in this game. So this wasn't um, the best example of prophylaxis. This is rather allowing the opponent lots of counts play and going for the opponent's king at the same time. Uh, so here knight b6, and um, after knight e2, Alakine's not afraid to play d4. So he's trying to really um, put more pressure on d3. So he's firmly blocked d3, and it's going to become a target later. And not only that, these dark squares are going to be trying to be exposed with this e3 square as an excuse to try and get rid of white's dark squared bishop. So this is the plan for Malachine. And if he can do that, he can also try and get this bishop raging down as an, an attack on white's king. And maybe even f6 later, and if ef, gf, and g file as well. So that's Alakine's basic attacking plan. Um, the gist of it anyway. Try and undermine d3, that's the exploitable base. Try and use the diagonals and, and get an attack with f6 later. As you would in the French, f6 is on, often a common undermining move at the, at the head of the pawn chain in any case. So, um, Nimzovich is aware of the risks of his next move, but uh, it does offer some opportunities. He plays g4, so he knows that f6 might be coming. Uh, so knight g3 to e4 is afforded by g4. And if, if black's not careful, maybe even g5, just binding um, f6. So g takes and use, and white uses the g file. So f6 seems well timed here if white's going to play g5 uh, or threaten to. So um, f6 by black. So we have ef, gf, and the first sign of this g file usage is here from black. So black's capturing towards the center. But um, one thing about this, as I say, this e4 square is interesting for white to make use of. So knight g3, and now we see this move knight d5. Okay, there's immediate pressure on f4, but it's not a big deal right at the moment until black's next move. So queen e2, bishop d6, and now an awkward move is forced to defend this f f pawn. 
Now here, um, let's see, f5 was that playable. The move played was actually knight h4, protecting f4. But uh, is, is f5 looks as though there's probably a tactical problem like knight f4. Let's just check this position. Was f5 actually playable? Knight h4 is given as one of the strongest moves in this position actually. f5, oh just e takes. So say um, g takes, there'll be bishop g3 and bishop f5 I guess. And if knight takes, rook e8, and that's kind of embarrassing now for white. I think there's a lot of tactical pressure here. So knight e3 blacks onto that e3 square. So this ex this exposes, you know, wh white's got a bit of a dodgy position here. If black uh, can blast open the dark squares, this f4, f5 would only serve to weaken key dark squares, I think, in white's position. So Nimzo's next move was actually probably um, a very good move for the position, one of the, one of the only moves. Knight h5 is also uh, a recommendation, but knight h4 might be the best, in fact. Okay. So knight c to e7, right? So this clears away this diagonal, actually. If black wants to finish to the bishop, um, and maybe b5 for c4, then um, th this is going to be dangerous as well as the g file. Maybe also it supports f5, and also maybe knight g6 as well. Okay. So bishop d2 is played, so it connects the rooks. So Nimzo can put more pressure on the e file as well. Uh, so Queen c7 now putting more pressure on that poor f pawn. So that has to be supported again. And now, as well as the queen, you know, targeting f4, it also supports c4. So this poor d3 pawn is a target as well. In fact, herein uh, lies another point of knight c e7. It wasn't just the maneuver knight. It supports d5 against this continual idea of bishop takes d5 or f5 trying to undermine d5. So, so that's another point about knight c e7 from earlier. Okay, so c4. So it looks as though Nimzo has been put under huge pressure here on the c file, on his d3 pawn, on his f pawn. Potentially this bishop is going to be challenged and potentially the g file is also going to be challenged. So we have a dramatic game on our hands. C f d takes c4 is played by Nimzo. So exposing his c pawn, he's been undermined. Okay, and Alakine is not content with queen takes c4 here. Now let's check that out. Queen takes c4 here. Could that have been simply played? It, it, it's given actually as... as um, move offering a slight advantage to black as it sort of visually appears anyway so say um, knight e4 the bishop can go back to c7 say b3 queen can go to c6 say g5 so here it seems black has adequate defensive resources ah it's switched now actually evaluation has switched after that fg so maybe white's okay here, he's got enough dynamic potential against black's king, which seems to echo the main game um, continuation. After g5 it seems white's getting an edge. So really we've got a balance here of a kingside attack, a direct kingside attack, um, which makes it very difficult to assess properly the positions here. You know, will this undermining operation exposing C2 and white structure be enough to compensate for the dynamic potential of white's attacking forces, which, um, you know, are quite at well placed for, for an attack? So, um, knight e3, though, is played by Alakine, so maybe that's a better practical decision to rob white of this dark square bishop and expose this diagonal, as well as potentially later this diagonal. So, after bishop takes, d takes. Nimzo says goodbye to his uh, bishop. He can't take on e3. Bishop c5 would embarrass the skewer his queen to the king. So queen f3, and now queen takes c4. So that first operation with knight e3 seems a very practical decision. Okay, but the knight was kind of nice on d5. That's the only thing. And now Nimzo can use the knight, the e4 square for his knight, and now offers. After the bishop c7, the queen and bishop are on the same um, uh, file, so so b b3 c can be used to kick the queen. Black doesn't want to play queen takes c2 because rook c1. 
So B3 is played here. Okay. So the undermining operation hasn't left White with a totally shattered queenside structure. Tactically, he's holding it together, Nimzo. So C3 is even kicking the queen again, rather cheekily. The, the, the queen on b6 is now blocking that b pawn. It's going to take a while if black wants to fear and check the bishop. But the bishop can come like this to occupy this dangerous diagonal. So king h1. Now the knight recharges the other one on d5 as a replacement. Okay. So hitting f4, protecting e3. Maybe also other ideas are supported now. So f5 was played. Perhaps actually black might have missed the chance in this position for f5. Let's let's just check this position. Because white playing f5 seems to get a dangerous attacking pawn wedge. In fact here Ripka does suggest that f5 would leave black slightly better on initial analysis. Say knight g3, rook d8. So this this might be okay for black or even even better for black, slightly better. So in the game continuation there was an attacking wedge uh, created because after this knight d5 Nimzo simply played f5 which for me seems to complement the knight on e4. It's a kind of, you know, if you've got a nice knight on e4 you don't want it rudely like taken away by a move like f5. So playing f5, okay, it weakens the dark squares and white hasn't got the dark square bishop. But you know there's ups and downs in chess and um, the downside is it's tried to be exploited. Knight f4, so onto that dark square now. If black can rob white of this light square bishop and then get onto the diagonal, this would look to be like a ferocious attack emerging on the white king. So rook f d1, okay seizing the centre, lots of opportunities in the centre, the balcons of the chessboard as Zimbabwe would say. He's immediately stopping bishop d7 to c6 as well. Okay, so he's delaying Black's potential uh, uh, vicious attacking opportunities. King h8. There's no dark square bishop to go on to this diagonal. So the king vacates g8. So there'll be more pressure on the g file as well as potentially if Black can get this maneuver going. Bishop f1. Okay, the bishop's got opportunities potentially on this diagonal. And as the game shows, that was a fantastic resource later. Bishop c4. So black here, Aliakin took on f5 and played bishop e5. Okay, he's supporting um, f6. It seems a strong positional move to play uh, bishop e5. Um, if if this um, knight's uh, continually uh, supported on f4, so black's establishing quite a few sort of pieces and pawns on these dark squares. So White's position looks kind of infiltrated. But Nimzo nevertheless he goes for that E3 pawn. Uh, but at the expense of losing that D file possession and so Bishop D7 is not restricted now as a move from black which Aniakin uses now and he gets on this critical diagonal. So has Nimzo really blundered going for this pawn? This is getting absolutely critical now. Rook takes e3, bishop c6. The pressure is mounting. As initially uh, described a, a while back, the diagonal and the g-file. And this, this knight and bishop on these dark squares doesn't make for a very pleasant picture here of what's going on. But here is why chess is so complex. The dynamism of king's safety is sometimes very difficult to calculate. Nimzo protects his rook on e3 overprotects his rook which means his queen is now free to move but it hasn't got that many squares the knight on on um, f4 deprives h5 and h3 and g2 and um, this is this is still a very dangerous position uh, but here knight d5 after rook d3 Ayakin snatches a pawn knight takes c3 uh, but here is a very nice combination from from them, which, which initially I thought was winning when I first annotated this game uh, back in 2007, which I'll reply actually to this video. But um, there was a saving resource to this seemingly amazing combination, which uh, Anyakin didn't uh, find, so he got blasted from this position. So the initial move, I'll give you 10 seconds to see if you can spot it.